wanted to do an introduction to uh, clay. Before you can make pots, you have to know what clay is. You have to have clay. Um, now you can make pots from clay that you don't know anything about and you can follow instructions and probably succeed for a little while that way. Sooner or later though you're going to want a little more creative control, I think. Um, plus I think it's just fun to understand your material. And now I'm no expert, I'll put that up right right here, especially on clays. I, I, uh, I mix my own clay body until I got one that worked, until I liked it, but I, I really think it could be refined more. Um, but I think it's important to understand the basics. So before you can make pots, I feel like I should at least teach you something about clay. First thing I want to mention is this book. This is a really good book in general. It's called What Every Potter Should Know. And it's really, it's not very thick, you know. But it's got a lot of good information, and it's def definitely worth buying if you're doing it yourself and maybe you don't understand uh, what you're doing. That book covers clay very well. It's one of the better ones, actually. Um, there's all the other books, Clay and Glazes for the Potter by, by Daniel Rhodes is a good one, um, but it doesn't go into as much detail. I think this is a better book. I think the two books together is a, are good resources. So for detailed information, I would go there. One thing that I did when I first started, uh, I didn't understand what clay was. I had my early training in high school, and they provided the clay. And I do remember we had Reclaim, um, which is you know using old clay that I didn't really know where it came from either. But then you put that in the pug mill, which is a big machine with screws, and it, it churns it up and mixes it really well. Uh, and so you put this wet, sloppy mud in there along with a powdered clay, and it came out usable clay. And that was the extent of it that I understood. So then when I went on my own and I decided, okay, time to go get clay, um, I, I decided early on I wanted to mix it myself. And I can talk more about that later. So I But thinking that I could just buy a bag of clay and mix it with water, just like you would plaster or concrete or any other, you know, material. But it doesn't work that way. And I showed up at the clay supplier and I said, yeah, I like a bag of clay. You know, and they proceeded to educate me a little bit about what I needed, which is what I'm going to do now. If you're going to mix your own clay, you need a recipe. So what's in a recipe? Well, there is pretty much an endless amount of variation, uh, depending on where you're at, on what your needs are, um, and what kind of things you like, and your abilities, and you name it. It's going to be something you're going to have to figure out yourself. First, you need to identify what you need the clay for. You know, is it sculpture? Is it high fire, low fire? I guess one of the important things you need to know is what the firing temperature is going to be. How hot is this clay going to have to be pushed? Um, where, what temperature, they say, does it mature at? That's what the terminology is. You need to, you're going to need to know that. So I'm going to speak basically focused on high fire stoneware because that's what I know. That's what I do. The basic clays you have, you have fire clays, which are really, those are the ones that are, that are probably the least consistent. Um, they're heavy tooth, crude, you know, they're the workhorse, manly, gruff clays, okay? They're highly refractory. Uh, they've got bits of gra grain and sand, and uh, they're not elastic. Um, they're, very, they're very rough clays. Uh, but they're good because they add a lot of strength they reduce the shrinkage, which we're always about reducing shrinkage. Um, they add that tooth to give you some structure. Then you have ball clays. Ball clays are sort of the opposite. They're the fine grain, elastic ones. Those are used for making clay shapeable, pliable, um, smooth. They also increase drastically the shrinkage rate. So they, and they increase things like warping and cracking when the clay dries. Um, so there's always a balance there. So there's fire clay, ball clay, there's kaolin, which is a white, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right by the way, kaolin. If it's a white clay, it's what's primarily used in porcelain. You mix that usually with feldspar. Then there's stoneware clays, which I touched on, which are basically medium grain, refractory clays, medium particle size. Uh, there's earthenware clays. These are smoother, lower, lower melting clays. These are kind of things that you might dig up in a riverbed um, as <clears throat> they would melt into a glaze sometimes even at the temperatures I work with. 
they often have iron oxide in them. A, an example of this might be red art clay. Um, they're red in color, so many of them, but not all. And then there's bentonite, which I just throw in there because it is technically a clay, although I don't use it in my clay bodies. It's like extreme ball clay, um, but it's so extreme it's really not in that category either. It's an incredible. It's almost a jelly, and it's a, it 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 has an incredible shrinkage. But its key is its elasticity. If you're going to use it in a clay body, it'll really help the elasticity. Um, but there's a lot of dangers of other things like warping and cracking. So you have to be careful with the proportions you use. So then you know, those are your clays. Then you have fluxes. You add fluxes to the clay body. Um, basically to determine when it matures. That's where you set your melting point. Fluxes help all those refractory things in the clays melt. So you don't want it to melt, obviously, but you want it to melt a little bit. Um, I don't know, in a way a good analogy might be a glass of ice water, uh, like a slushy. If you pour water in this crushed ice, there's a point at which there's more ice than water, and you know, when you're sucking it dry, you can't get any, you know, you can't get any of the good stuff, right? There's a lot of air in the ice. Then there's a point where it's saturated with liquid, and that's perfect because it's got it's like perfect ratio there. And then there's a point where it's mostly all liquid and melty and runny, and there's a little bit of ice maybe floating on top. That's kind of how clay works. You have the particles, the big chunks, and then as they melt, they sort of fill in with liquid. It's a way to think about it anyway. So you want it. You could err on the side of just saying, I'm not going to put any fluxes in there. It doesn't have to melt at all. It'll still be a hard clay, but it'll have a lot of, it'll have a lot of porosity, uh, a lot of air in there. Um, <clears throat> and that's not so good because if you pour water in there, it leaks out and things like that. Some common fluxes are, um, what do I have here, a talc and feldspar. Feldspar is what I use. And again, with fluxes, it's very important to you to to keep the particle size in consideration because, again, with an ice analogy, a bunch of shredded ice melts faster than the same volume in one big cube. So, particle size, smaller particle sizes melt a lot easier, a lot lower temperatures, or or at least a lot less time. Um, then the next thing you have three basic things: you have the clays, the fluxes, and then you have fillers. Fillers are just like just what they sound like. Um, they usually are added to help shrinkage and warping because um, those are the things you fight a lot, uh, warping and cracking. Fillers are like grog, which is basically the clay body fired and ground up. So it's like little rocks. It's like sand. But the thing about grog that makes it different than sand is that it's chemically equivalent to the clay. So when it's all fired up, uh, it sort of blends in. But it's got rocks and angular, angular um, shape so it's also good for strength that angular angular shape like if a crack runs through it'll hit that and stop a lot uh, and it's good for tooth and everything else there's silica which is the common um, the common filler uh, silica sand is another one it's basically like rog it's just sand but because it's round uh, it does help a little bit with the elasticity things that, that if you think about like a marble and, and clay round things tend to slide around more like ball bearings, you know, so it helps with the elasticity. So those are the basic things. And so you get those materials together and you have recipes, you know, there's books that have it. This book I mentioned has some. And you test it. Um, before you test it, though, you need to mix it up and age it. Most recipes involve many different materials. The advantage to using many different materials is these materials are not made typically for the potter. They're usually made for bigger business, uh, bigger production, and the quality control is kind of marginal. Um, so the, the, the composition, the chemical composition, which as a potter you might need pretty strict control over, needs to be pretty accurate, fluctuates widely depending on where, where they're mined, when they're mined, that sort of thing, uh, which they do. They mine clay like any other, you know, mining coal or whatever. Um, because they fluctuate so much, if you use 100% of one material, and let's say something in it, like the silica content, fluctuates by 5% versus one bag or another, um, that's going to throw you off by 5%, which is enough to make a difference. But if you only use, say, 50% of that material, then it's only going to throw you off 2.5%. Maybe you, th you, maybe you, th you uh, use even less, you know, 20%. If you have a material that is like, you know, 20% this, 20% that, 20%, it's going to be a lot more consistent throughout because your variations aren't going to be as extreme. 
another another reason is a lot of times these materials are available and then the mine shuts down and they become unavailable. So if you hinge your entire clay body off one primary clay, you run the risk of it going out of business and you don't have that clay anymore. That and so you're going to have to then redevelop things. Whereas if you had that clay in a smaller percentage, you could just swap it out for another similar clay and it wouldn't be so uh, devastating. How do you mix it up? You mix it up dry, uh, usually by weights in a percentage ratio. So you weigh it dry and then you add water. How much water do you add? That depends on what your mixing method is. Um, if you have time, I recommend mixing it wet with overkill water and making a real thin slip out of it and then taking that th slip and putting it on plaster or some other absorbent surface. Plaster works really well. Um, and drying it out that way until it's the consistency you want and then basically just kneading it up, lumping it in a ball. And you stick it in a plastic bag and you age it. The reason that I like that method is my dog's up there. The reason that I like that method is it helps eliminate air in the clay. Otherwise, you can just mix it up with the appropriate amount of water until it's the right consistency. Do the same thing. And you always want to store it. You want to age it at least a month, uh, preferably longer. I don't know. It becomes ridiculous. Uh, so I think three months is adequate. Um, obviously, the longer you age it, the better, but then you run risks of things like it drying out. Totally okay if it gets moldy. You want it to get moldy. Um, mold, the little spore film, the little fibers of the mold get in there and help break the clay down, help get water in places. The, a moldy clay is good. So don't don't put things like bleach or anything. You don't want to kill it. That's a misconception. People try to, to do that sometimes. You don't want to sterilize your clay. Um, if you want to help it, sometimes I add a little beer. Uh, you can add yeast. You can add, uh, you know, yogurt. You can add some things like that to your clay if you want. Um, traditionally, it was urine was added to it to help with the the acid in there would help. Um, there's always little tricks. I don't really do too much of that. Uh, a lot of times I'll just throw my coffee in there because I'll mix clay in the morning and I'll have some a cup of coffee and I'll throw one in for luck, just to give it some food, you know. Because I think mold mold's a good thing. You want it to you want it to age. You want it to get moldy. Then you fire it up and test it. Test it with your glazes. That's the first uh, first thing as far as mixing your clay. That's how that's how you do it. Of course, if you don't want to mix your clay, you can buy it pre-made. Um, somebody else has done all that figuring out for you, and you can just buy what you want. And that's really the way you probably should go. Um, as far as money and consistency and everything else, and quality of clay, it's probably better. It's slightly more expensive cash out of your pocket. But as that book will mention, it's misleading because the time spent mixing and the and the labor involved and the risk of injuring yourself and the where you store the raw materials and all of that stuff translates into money lost. So, you know, yeah, it might be cash up front, but really, in the long run, it's cheaper. You do give up creative control. I had hoped to get into a little bit more of the clay physics, but. I think I'm already going over my limit here, so I'm going to go ahead and end this right now. Hope that gives you an understanding of what is involved a little bit in clay. So until next time, thanks for watching again. Bye.